In any electrostatic situation with a conductor, the electric field at every point within it is zero. Also, when excess charge is placed on a solid conductor, the charge is located entirely on the surface of the conductor. We assume conductor is mounted on an insulating stand. Now, if there is a hollow cavity inside the solid conductor, then a surrounding Gaussian surface, B, as shown, will have zero charges and so for its surface the electric field is zero. Now suppose a conductor is placed with inside the hollow cavity carrying a charge Q. So here we have a charge carrying a charge Q. I've denoted it here as four uh, plus charges. So according to Gauss's law the net charge inside this surface must be zero. So, the net charge on this surface here is zero. So there must be a net charge of minus Q on inner cavity surface and a plus Q on surface of conductors on the surface of the conducting solid. So, in other words, what we're saying is inside the surface of this cavity because of this charge in the middle we've got four charges positive charge here we must have uh, opposite charges on the inside of this cavity but that also means that on the outside of this conductor we're going to have the 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 balance of those charges in other words the other the four are going to show uh, on the outside of this conducting solid So there must be a net charge of minus Q on inner cavity surface and a plus Q on surface of conducting solid. If the outer solid surface originally had a charge, say Q, then now it will have a charge of Q plus Q dash whenever the Q charge is placed within the cavity. So whenever we put this Q charge in the cavity, we're going to have uh, an equivalent uh, amount of that Q charge on the surface of the conducting solid. Now let's consider the following experiment. We place a conducting container such as a tin can on an insulating stand. The container is initially uncharged then we hang a charged metal ball from an insulating thread and lower it into the can. Put a lid on with a slit to allow for thread. Charges are induced on walls of the container like so so all these charges now will be induced because of the uh, the attractive and repulsive forces of these plus charges. You're going to see that the that there's going to be minus charges on the inside of the cavity and on the outside you're going to have plus charges. But now we let the ball touch the inner wall, then the surface of ball becomes effectively part of the cavity inner. So all charge will be on outer tin surface and the ball and inner surface will have zero charges. So upon lifting the ball back out, so it will have zero charge. All charge from ball now is on the outer surface of the tin, as shown here. OK, this tin and ball experiment confirms the validity of Gauss's law and therefore of Coulomb's law. So you might say, what is the point? Well, simply this. Coulomb's experimental methods using a torsion balance and dividing charges were not very precise. It was difficult to confirm with great precision the 1 over r squared dependence of the electrostatic force by direct measurement. So to verify Gauss's law, hence Coulomb's law, a more accurate method is to use an inner and outer sphere and trial with different amounts of charge on outer sphere. like here. The outer surface can be alternatively charged and discharged by the power supply to which it is connected. If there is any flow of charge between inner and outer surface it is detected by the electrometer inside the inner surface. We can determine 1 over r squared to incredible precision so there is no reason to suspect the exponent 2 
is anything other than exactly 2. So there's no reason to suspect that's not the case, because by doing this experiment, we're able to confirm that that exponent is exactly 2. So this all came about by Gauss thinking about point charges as little spheres and making the valid and correct assumption that the force lines animating from the charge, the electric field flux, would be directly proportional to the charge. So this whole discussion also forms the basis for electrostatic shielding. For example, suppose we have a very sensitive electronic instrument that must be protected from stray electric fields. We surround the instrument with a conducting box, as so let's say the experiment is inside this conducting box. Or we line the walls, ceiling uh, and floor with copper sheets, maybe. The external electric field redistributes the free electrons in the conductor, leaving a net positive charge on the outer surface in some regions and a net negative charge in others. So you can see here with the field lines going in, the negative charges are attracted to this side, and where the field lines are going this way, obviously the positive charges are attracted on that side. The external electric field redistributes the free electrons in the conductor, leaving a net positive charge on outer surface in some regions and a net negative charge on others. The inductive effect redistributes the field lines, and as always, since no charges are within the metal box, so that means that uh, there's no uh, electric field lines at all inside the box. So any experiment here, if you place a, a metal box, right, inside a metal box, then it doesn't matter what's going on outside the metal box, no matter how strong these electric fields are here, it's not going to uh, affect the experiment at all with inside the metal box. So this is what, this is the, the whole uh, basis of electrostatic shielding. Finally, we know that there is a direct relation between the E-field at any point just outside a conductor and the surface charge density, sigma, on the conductor at that point. At any such point, uh, the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface. To find a relation between sigma, the surface charge density, at any point on the surface and the electric field at the point, we construct a Gaussian surface in the form of a small cylinder like so. So here we've got our Gaussian surface. One end face with area A lies within the conductor and the other lies just outside. The electric field is zero at all points within the conductor. Outside the conductor the normal component of the electric field is zero at the side walls of the cylinder. So it's zero on these side walls here since the electric field E is normal to the conductor, while at the end faces the normal component is equal to the electric field. Hence from Gauss's law the electric field times the area is simply equal to the charge density times the area over epsilon naught. So we have this relationship. This equation agrees with the results already obtained for spherical, cylindrical and plane surfaces.